The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. A new week is upon us, and with it comes a new set of goals here on Fantasy NBA Today. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast presented by hoop-ball.com and our good friends over at Hawaiian Isles. Kona Coffee Company, H.I. Kona Coffee on Twitter, HawaiianIsles.com, Hawaiian Isles on Amazon. It is Prime eligible. You guys know this by now. Although we're at a point here where uh, new folks are tuning into the podcast, not daily necessarily, but uh, weekly, bi-weekly at this point of the year, so... Welcome to the fray. Want to suggest you check out one of our partners here. Again, it is Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee. You go to Amazon.com. This is the fastest way to do it. Type in Hawaiian I S. That's as far as you need to get before Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee comes up as the suggested search. Hawaiian space I S. That's it. Uh, and their vanilla macadamia nut bag is the Amazon's choice winner. Amazon's choice. I don't know how you get that tag, but they've got it. So check it out. Uh, that's the 24-ounce bag. You can get it prime uh, one day. You can get it tomorrow. You should. Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee Company. Proud partners of all of our audiovisual activity here at hoop-ball.com. I am Dan Bespris at Dan Bespris on Twitter at D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. I know. The old adage, if you can spell it, you can find me. And if you can find me, then I'd love to have you find me. Dan Bespris on Twitter, uh, at HoopBall Tweets, at HoopBall Fantasy. Those are the ones you want to follow here through HoopBall. This is, I'm going to be doing more of this over the next uh, three months or so because now we're in the slow but methodical ramp up. About two and a half months from the start of the season, just a slightly over that, which. Still sounds like a really long time, but it's going to go fast. Fear not, because we're like a month away from hard uh, mock draft season, and then a month later you're doing your own real drafts, and then like a week and a half after that you've got your actual season. So we're we're not that far away. Uh, In terms of just kind of how we're going to be structuring this show, this beginning part, which I know drives people crazy, but it's so important this time of year. You may have known that I did very little of this promo stuff during the offseason. There were intermittent shows where I would spend three or four minutes on it, but not regularly. But now that we're into a a phase where new people are finding the podcast, I got to make sure that you know folks know all the good stuff that we've got available to you here at HoopBall and through the show. So again, you've got the Twitter handles. I'll give you everybody else's as they come along. Uh, One thing I'd love it if you guys had an opportunity to do would be to rate and review the podcast. If you get to the end of this show and you're a relatively new listener, uh, or even maybe you've been listening for a long time and you just keep forgetting to do it, please do drop us a five-star rating and or a review. We don't even need the review. I love it if you write something kind, but at the end of the day, the rating is the thing that really jumps it up the charts. The higher the rating, the more the ratings, the higher you are on the iTunes results list which makes it easy. When somebody types in fantasy, maybe we'll show up on the screen. Certainly, if they look for fantasy NBA at this point, I think we will show up on the screen. Uh, iTunes is the obviously the, the big bopper for that. So that's our, that's our currency here. A lot of folks have ways that you can supply money to their show. We don't have that. We just want your ratings and reviews. That's all we ask of you. Uh, and the question is, can you figure out how to do it? Because iTunes continually changes (laughs) where where it all is. Uh, I found it on my computer pretty easily. If you're on the the podcast tab in iTunes on a PC, you just click on over and then there's a rate and review button. If you're on your phone and you're on an Apple device, you go to the search tab, type in Fantasy NBA Today, click on the name of the show. And then I believe, let's see here, do you have to scroll all the way to the bottom? Yeah, you scroll all the way down once you click on the name of the show and then you can rate and review it. No one's written a review in like three or four months. You've given them, you've rated the show, but no one's written anything. So write something funny, give it a five-star review, we'll love you forever. Okay, done with the promo stuff on today's podcast. Apologies, I know, it's annoying, uh, but there's going to be a couple minutes of that at the beginning of most shows here going forward, just to make sure you guys are all aware of what we need 
and uh, what we have available to you. The next part of this structure discussion is that Fantasy School is no longer in session. If you missed any of those shows, uh, they were Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, each of the last two weeks. We did Fantasy 101 and then Fantasy 201. Each of the last two weeks going through broad topic fantasy strategy podcast. We didn't get into names. We didn't get into teams. We didn't get into rankings. None of that stuff. It's too, it was, I should say, too early. Rosters were not completely settled. They were close. But it was time to really dial it back a little bit. So we talked about roster construction. We talked about streaming. We talked about league settings, average draft position, early uh, rounds in your drafts. We talked about the use of quantity, quality on mock drafts, how to structure all of that stuff. It was really a primer, those six shows on how to get yourself ready for an NBA fantasy season. Now we pivot more towards actual data, right? You start big, and then you narrow it in. You go big picture to little picture. So we're going to start to get a little bit more little picture moving forward on these podcasts. The next step of that, if you want to call it medium picture, is to take a look at some of the teams now as they are currently constructed and more of kind of an arrow up, arrow down situation as opposed to individual I mean, we're doing this, we're doing it, but it's not the main point of what we're about to do. So uh, on the shows that I'm hosting, and that's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday right now, obviously as we get a little closer to the season, we'll transition back to uh, Dan doing all five. But right now, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we're going to be breaking down anywhere from two to three teams per show as we go back through the newly constructed rosters in the NBA And just give a little bit of a look of, hey, these are the guys that are probably going to have a little bit of a value margin. I could waste a bunch of time telling you what that all means, uh, but we might as well just dive right into it. So let's start here on the left coast. Why not? Let's go right into my backyard, the Lakers. I'd like to try to get through three teams per show, but we'll see how that goes depending on pacing. This is one of the advantages to having a a five-show-a-week podcast is that you don't have to have it completely built out beforehand. You can have a, a general idea and then uh, go from there. The Lakers. The Lakers, we've got their new roster now. It's all settled in. And we're going to go through these names, piece by piece, name by name, in, I don't think we're going to say any real particular order here. I don't know that there's a point in necessarily going through it by order. Uh, because most of these guys were on different teams last year anyway. So it's not like we can just go through the Lakers roster and say, okay, well, here's what the guys did last year, because those guys were mostly gone. We'll start at the top. We'll start at the top. Anthony Davis. Simple enough. What do we think about Anthony Davis season over season? This is basically how we're going to be looking at this. How do, we, how do we think he does in his new environment? Better, worse, or the same? How do we think he's valued in his new environment? Better, worse, or the same? And what does that mean from a fantasy draft standpoint? Number one, Anthony Davis. He was the number two player in per-game value in 9-cat last year. He was behind James Harden. A lot of that was uh, because of the you know four or five games where he just played half a ball game. It's not because he missed 26 games. That was not factored into this. That's also not happening again. Right? If you dig in on the Anthony Davis stuff, you realize that he just didn't play basically the last month of the year. He pretty much didn't play. He missed like... I should should probably pull up the exact number just so that we're not talking in hypotheticals here. But I don't want to get too bogged down in when exactly he stopped playing basketball games. Suffice it to say that his last game uh, occurred on March the 24th, but he was playing two games and then skipping one for a month before that, basically since his trade demand at the All-Star break. So after the All-Star break, which started on February 22nd, Anthony Davis played one and then missed one, Played three and then missed one. Two, one off. Two, one off. Two, one off. One, and then didn't play the rest of the year in their final 
uh, seven ball games. So he missed seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve games after the NBA All Star break and played in let's see, four, six, eight, ten, eleven. He missed more games than he played in after the All Star break. So twelve of those twenty six games came after his trade demand. And he missed, I think it was about eight or nine in January. But other than that, he was actually pretty damn healthy last year. He was inactive early in the year for two games. Played, it looks like he missed like three out of four. I think some of that was being a little extra careful. Uh, But when he was actually trying to get on the basketball court, he was only missing about a game a month, one and a half or so. Then he had that slightly longer stretch where he missed about uh, two and a half, two and a half weeks or so between January and February. If you build that into your expectation as Anthony Davis this year, I think you can expect 70. I think that's the goal for him, is to get to around 70 games played this season, which would, in my estimation, probably still make him the number one guy in fantasy, which is incredible to think, because if you don't have these half games blended in, Right, Because even in the 11 games that he played after the All-Star break, it was 19, 20, 21, 21, 22, 21. Well, for the next three games in a row, 22, 21, and then 21 again. He didn't even play half a game. He didn't even hit 24 minutes in those 11 games. So that was sagging his numbers because he had only played 45 games prior to that stretch. Right, So it was easier to move his average values around. He was, by average, the number one guy last year, and prior to those 11 games dropping his numbers, it wasn't close. Even with James Harden, he was knocking him out of the park. I know that he's playing with LeBron James now. Let's transition from last year to this year a little bit on AD. I know that he's playing with LeBron James now, uh, but he's going to have more than his fair share of opportunity with this Lakers team. And frankly... I don't care that much if his scoring takes a very slight dip. His percentages are outstanding. 52% from the field last year, 80% at the free throw line, made a three-pointer, 12 rebounds, four assists, one and a half steals, two and a half blocks per game. Only two turnovers. I I see almost no reason why those numbers should take a hit. He was only averaging 33 minutes a game. You know, he's resting 15 minutes a night. Again, that was, you know, some of that was built in with the the low numbers towards the end of the year. If you pull, again, you have to sort of yank out some of that late season stuff and talk about a guy playing closer to 35, 36 minutes, that number probably won't be the same. I don't think the Lakers want him on the floor for that many minutes per ball game. I think they'd be gunning for more like 33 or 34. So his full season numbers are actually not that far off from what I think can be your expectation this coming year. Last year, he just got there in a different way. He played a boatload of minutes for 45 games and then very few minutes for 11. And it pulled him down a little bit. This coming year, it'll just be, you know, we'll keep you around 33 almost every night. I'm sure they'll go big every once in a while, but it'll average out. There'll be blowout wins and losses, and, and it'll settle around a particular number. So, my estimation is Arrow basically the same. It'll be slightly down from when he was kind of the lone wolf with that New Orleans team. I know he had Drew Holiday. It, uh, Drew is outstanding basketball player, but Anthony it was Anthony Davis 1, 1A and 1B, the options on offense for that team last year, and that's just not going to be the same with the Lakers. So, yeah, it'll come down from his high point last season, basically the pre-All-Star break stuff, but it, I think, will be pretty close to what you had when you rolled all of last year's junk together. And with James Harden likely taking a hit, and the guys behind AD a pretty good distance back in ranking in 9-cat, that probably they're not making up that big of a jump, there's a very real opportunity for AD to be the number one guy in fantasy again. So Arrow slightly sideways. For Anthony Davis. Arrow the same. What about LeBron James, the other big name in Los Angeles? Kata can't do L.A. without doing the two superstars first. LeBron played in only 55 games last year. 
Averaged 35 minutes a game, 27 points, 8.5 boards, 8 assists, 1.3 steals, half a block, two three-pointers, 51% from the field, and a very high volume, 67% at the free throw line. That is a soul-crushing number that probably isn't going anywhere. Is there any reason for us to think that LeBron James is going to magically remember how to shoot free throws? He was never great. He had a season of 78% at the line. He had a number of seasons in the mid-70s. But two of his last three years have been at 67%. His last season with Cleveland, he got back up to 73 And that was part of what f- really floated his fantasy value that year, is that he wasn't destroying you at the foul line the way that seven and a half attempts at 67% is doing. From an efficiency standpoint, you could argue that maybe LeBron gets a little bit better, but I don't know that that's the case as he's aging. I think what you got here from LeBron is that you're just going to see a guy who has who doesn't have to dominate quite as hard, but still quite a lot. So the question you have to ask yourself as you're assessing whether LeBron's value is going to go up, down, or stay the same is, does a very slight decrease in volume hurt him more than it helps him. Because fewer turnovers, fewer free throw attempts, if you mix that in with less scoring, fewer field goal attempts, which again, he's a good field goal percent guy to have on your team, which one is probably the more powerful number? I would venture to say that the decrease in the positive stats is probably the bigger factor. So there's a very slight down arrow for LeBron James this coming year. He's going to be playing with a guy who's a far better rebounder than anyone the Lakers had on their team last season. So that 8.5 might come down for Bron, and I'm sure he'd prefer not to have to grab 8.5 rebounds a night. The assists are going to stay high. He's going to be orchestrating the offense a lot. We've heard he's going to be playing point on the offensive side, so assists should be just fine for him. Scoring, that has to come down a little bit. 20 field goal attempts per game. When you add Anthony Davis, another guy who was taking 19, 18, 19 last year, 20 when he was actually on the floor for most of the game, that's coming from somewhere. And yes, a lot of it's coming from the other Clanko guys that the Lakers sent away or didn't retain, but some of it's going to come from LeBron. So the volume is coming down. Scoring is going to come down from 27. Free uh, three pointers are probably going to come down from two. Rebounds will come down a little bit. Uh, assists stay the same. Might even go up. Just having superior teammates this year. Uh, free throw number will come down. We don't know anything about the percentages. Turnovers will probably come down a tiny bit as well. Although that's kind of remains to be seen. So LeBron was number 24 in 9-cat on a per-game basis. I'm not that worried about his health yet. I need to see two seasons where he undergoes an injury that causes him to miss two months before I really believe that that's the norm now. Obviously, age combined with one big injury, you start to you have to put it in your bucket. Uh, but this is not a guy that I'm going to end up with very often anyway. Outside of points formats, uh, that free throw number is such a massive drag. And with the other stuff likely coming down a hair off his last couple of seasons where he really just had no help, uh, there's no reason to think that his numbers will actually rebound outside of efficiency and win-loss numbers. So I got an arrow down on LeBron. I don't think, even though he ended up at number 24 in 9-cat, I don't think there's a chance he falls that far in 9-cat drafts anyway. I mean, this is LeBron James. He'll be drafted in the second round of the absolute latest, and that's still too early. It's too early. He'd have to totally fix his free throw stroke to get back into that first round. It's a Russell Westbrook discussion, too. But we're not doing the Rockets today, so we can leave it alone. What about the non-superstars on the Lakers? Obviously, some of the guys that people are talking about on this team are Kyle Kuzma, Danny Green, DeMarcus Cousins, JaVale McGee. I hope people are not talking about Rajon Rondo and Avery Bradley as fantasy assets KCP. Let's try to keep our discussion here to guys that I actually think are going to be full season nine category values. So this is a discussion that eliminates things like streaming. You know, what if Danny Green gets hurt for a couple weeks? Yeah, 
KCP will probably have some fantasy value for those couple of weeks. What if, oh, I don't know. What if one of the superstars goes down? Yeah, um, someone else is going to have to pick up the pieces a little bit. But if you assume this team is healthy and you have to sort of build most of this into your thought process, then that's the way we assess these guys. So let's go to Kyle Kuzma because he's the guy that's going to get most likely the third most attention, at least from a fantasy standpoint. And I don't know that it's fully warranted. I like Kuzma. I, I think he's a decent basketball player. I, you know, offensively, he's already good with room to grow. His shot abandoned him last year, and he still put up 19 points a game. He played 33 minutes a night last year. Doesn't do much on the defensive end, and that's something that Frank Vogel's already said they're going to be working on. But listen, the love for Kyle Kuzma doesn't really extend beyond the realm of how he fits with some of these guys. Because from a fantasy standpoint, he was number 135 last year. Sandwiched between an underachieving Torian Prince and DJ Augustine. Surrounded by guys like Monty Morris, Mo Harkless, Freddie Van Fleet, Alfred Payton. These are fine basketball players, but they're not the types of guys that you would have guessed, I think, would be right next to Kuzma on last year's rankings based on how highly people were speaking of him in the fantasy realm. It just never made sense. He doesn't have a good fantasy stat set. His percentages are not great. I mean, if you could turn around those numbers, then yeah, then he becomes, you know, a scoring efficiency guy, but there's no efficiency. He doesn't get steals or blocks, so there's no way to make up ground there. It's all scoring, which is fine. You know, the Lakers are going to need guys that can react, can do things when LeBron and AD are drawing all that attention, guys that can relieve those two dudes from a scoring standpoint every once in a while. From a reality standpoint, he makes plenty of sense. Yes, again, he has his efficiency issues, so leave that alone for a minute. He's still only been in the league for two years. Uh, But from a fantasy standpoint, he makes no sense at all. So do not draft. Simple enough? Don't draft him. Again, we're talking nine-category roto now, so I don't want you guys coming at me like, eh, what if I'm in this blah-blah-blah format? Whatever. There are lots of different formats. Standard nine-cat roto is not going to be a full-season value. It's just not going to happen. He'd have to get his free throw percentage up by 5 to 7%. He'd have to get his field goal percentage up by 2 or 3, I would say, at the very least. Preferably more as a power forward. And there's almost no way that he can score 19 a game on a team with Anthony Davis and LeBron James. There's not 16 shots for him on this roster now. Especially not if he's coming off the bench, which I'm inclined to think he will because of the scoring firepower action he can provide with minimal defense. I don't know if he's part of their best lineup. I really don't know. He's part of a decent one, some decent ones, I would think, this coming year. So don't draft him. Easy enough. Wipe him out. He's going to get overdrafted anyway because he has powerhouse Lakers name recognition. What about Boogie? This is an interesting one because we really didn't get a chance to see what DeMarcus Cousins could be last year. In the 30 games he played over the course of the entire season, which, (laughs) again, we're, you know, we're we're trying to pick what we can from this information, and it's it's not the simplest thing in the world. Uh, He obviously didn't play at all until mid-January. And he managed to play a few games in the playoffs, which were a mixed bag. He had that second injury. He was actually putting up some pretty decent numbers as he appeared to be getting healthier with the Warriors. And it wasn't immediate. We knew it wasn't going to be an immediate thing. Guys always come back with some adrenaline, and then that wears off, and then things get slow. And then they start to pick it back up again. It was right around the beginning of March where Boogie started to look a little bit more like Boogie. 27-8-7 game with two steals, 13 points, six boards, six assists, three steals, six blocks. He did that in 27 minutes. 
I have a burning question about this Lakers roster, which is, what's the real playtime going to look like? Can the Lakers afford to have Boogie on the floor for 27 minutes a game? And the answer is, it doesn't matter. Because his fantasy game is so robust that even 24 minutes is enough to make him worth having on your fantasy roster. The question now becomes not whether or not, you know, you check the binary box of 0 or 1, A or B. Yeah, he's obviously a 1. He's a yes. He's a guy you draft. The question is where? And that's a big, tough question because... And, you know, we've heard Anthony Davis say he wants to play the four. He's going to have to play the five for some stretches. What if we conservatively say that Anthony Davis plays the five for only eight minutes a game? I think that's the absolute lowest number that you could see in that category. That leaves 40 minutes to split, basically, between JaVale McGee and Boogie. Now, personally, I think Anthony Davis is going to be playing center for more like 12 to 15 minutes per game uh, of the 30-whatever that he's on the floor, but maybe I'm wrong. You know, we've got LeBron. They probably want him to be guarding fours mostly on defense. Kuzma, same. They're just, there's, there's too much action at the four for Anthony Davis to not have to play 10 to 15 minutes at the five. There has to be, I, I, but, we'll, you know, we'll see how it shakes out. So again, most conservative estimate here. Anthony Davis plays eight minutes at the five. So 20 minutes apiece, Boogie and JaVale. Is that how we think it's going to happen? Is it going to be a hot hand thing? Is it going to be an opponent-based situation where if you need the length, the pick and roll, hammer dunk action of JaVale McGee, he sees the majority of the minutes where if you need the floor spacing, the scoring threat, the create his own shot of DeMarcus Cousins. Does Boogie see more of the time? I'm inclined to believe that JaVale McGee is going to be more like the one we saw in Golden State. Not completely dialed back to that point. But we were talking about a guy last year. JaVale averaged about 23 minutes a game with the Lakers. He went through that long lull when he was suffering from pneumonia. And if you... And you can't look around that. I mean, it's part of the picture from last year. But if you could somehow look around it, it was more like 26, 27 minutes, and then he just wasn't playing at all when he was sick. He wasn't the same guy. In 22 minutes a game last year, JaVale McGee, who ended up playing, by the way, 75 games. He just wasn't 100% for a lot of them. Averaged 12, 7.5, and, and 2 blocks. He was number 52 in 9-cat in 22 minutes a game. So if you think he's going to get to 18 minutes this year, he's a top 100 guy. So we're not kind of knocking out both centers at the same time. I believe, and we've heard athletes talk about this a lot, that it's really the second year after an Achilles injury where you see whether or not a guy is ever going to be close to himself again. That it takes one full year to recover, and then it takes another almost year whatever you want to call it, six, seven, eight months, depending on how long you know, you got the offseason and whatnot, for that player to actually get his legs back, to get the conditioning back, to get the feel back. And that would put Boogie on pace to be sort of anywhere close to what he used to be around December of this year. That would be 23 months, I think. In 26 minutes per game with Golden State last year, Boogie averaged 16 and 8 with 3.5 assists, 1.3 steals, 1.5 blocks, 48% shooting, a three pointer, 74% of the free throw line. That's never been his ultimate strong suit, right? That's not the reason you're drafting him. Uh, it does hurt a little bit. But he had some stretches of 75, 77, 78% in his career, and, and you just hope that it's not going to put too big of a ding into your stuff. When we're assessing fantasy value, you look at a stat set, and you try to extrapolate from there. And with Boogie, I am inclined to believe that he's going to get 24 minutes a game. I don't think that the Lakers signed him to play less than that. He loves playing alongside Anthony Davis, vice versa. They can stagger him because he is someone that can create, or was, at least. 
And it's just another option of a good passing big man who can move the ball, spread the floor, do a bunch of stuff. You can do a lot of stuff. And in 24 minutes a game, Boogie Cousins is a fantasy asset. As I mentioned, 26 minutes a game last year, he was number 34 on a per-game basis in 9-cat. You dial that back by 10%? I mean, you're still talking about a guy who could average 14 and 7 with a steal and a block. And three assists on decent field goal and not outstanding free throw percentage. What did I just say to you? 14, 7, 1, 1, and 1? Maybe more? Am I going on the low side? Possibly. He's a really good rebounder. Has been his whole career, really. I mean, that's a top 50 guy. So I think there's going to be a lot of fear around this Lakers big man spot. And... I think there's going to be a lot of fear around Boogie because of the injury situation. But I do think that if you can, and, and when I say he could end up at top 50, that doesn't mean take him there. You know, if somebody's drafting him at 45, you let him have him. You got to have some sort of margin. But I'm, I, listen, you know how much I have avoided Lakers in seasons past. But I loved JaVale last year. He was sort of a late training camp, got to go get him guy. And I think you could actually draft you could draft all three eligible centers on the Lakers, Boogie, JaVale, and Anthony Davis, and you'd be set. The question is, where could you get him? You'd have to go, you know, top three for AD. You'd probably have to go, what do you think? I think Boogie's probably getting drafted around 50. And that's a little bit too early for my taste. And I bet you could get JaVale McGee around 100 again. I would. In terms of the wings on the Lakers, uh, the only one that I would give the time of day to would be Danny Green, who uh, showed last year in Toronto with a little bit more responsibility. His field goal percent came way up. He was healthier, it would seem. His three-point percent was way higher than his career mark. I don't know that we can assume that'll stay put. Uh, And then .7 blocks and about a steal a game. So there's still some of that stuff in the tank, and I believe he's going to be playing. You might even see him play more minutes for the Lakers than he did with Toronto last year. The Raptors were uh, very deep, lots of blowouts. I think you could see Danny Green averaging 30 minutes a game. He's a guy that I would absolutely take for my old man squad at the tail end of a draft. You can't expect much. He's probably not going to average 10 points again, honestly. Uh, But you could look for something like 9-4, and With one and a half assists, a steal, a block, and two three-pointers. It's a top 100 guy. You know, we all know what Danny Green is at this point. We all know what Danny Green is. He's been the same guy for years. It all just comes down to opportunity. He was number 83 in 9-cat last year. He played 80 games. That's a fantasy asset. It's really a struggle to watch him on a night-to-night basis because he can disappear for two games and then he could explode for seven threes, four steals, and three blocks. We know the Danny Green rule. You evaluate him at the end of every month. I think he'll be a top 100 guy again. Lakers need people that can defend. They need people that can spread the floor. They have them. But if you think someone like Troy Daniels is going to play over Danny Green, I think you've got another thing coming. They need him on the floor for that defense, and he can guard multiple positions and well. He's playing a bunch this year. Make no mistake. I'm not drafting Caden Tavius, Caldwell, Pope. I'm not drafting Quinn Cook, Jared Dudley. I wish Alex Caruso could win the starting point guard job as the on the defensive side, but I don't think that's happening. Uh, I'm not drafting Caruso, Rondo, or Avery Bradley. So for the Lakers, the guys that I think will be inside the top 100 this coming year are obviously Anthony Davis and LeBron James. Uh, I think Danny Green, Boogie, and JaVale. I think there are five guys on this team inside the top 100, and I don't think Kyle Kuzma is one of them. This is the magic of having two superstars on a team, is that it creates these incredible efficiency avenues for other guys, for guys like JaVale to shoot 65% and block shots, for a Boogie to get in there and compliment them when one is off the floor 
and get easy looks against a clunky second unit with a nice fantasy stat set. There are guys on this team with good fantasy games that just need to have a tiny bit of opportunity, and I think you're seeing a handful of them that will. Just planting a flag in it for now, just for the hell of it, uh, the ranking of those guys will, at the end of the year, be Anthony Davis, LeBron James, Boogie, and I'm gonna put uh, I'm gonna put Danny Green just in front of JaVale McGee. I think both those guys end up right around number 90, 85 to 100 range. So they're not fun, right? Those aren't fun dudes you're drafting at the end of your thing. They're not massive upside guys unless someone gets hurt. But they do fill out a roster nicely, and if they get off to a hot start, you could package that. It's occurring to me as I go through these things that we're probably not going to be able to do three teams per show. Maybe there will be a few in there where uh, a couple of the clubs move a little bit faster. But let's transition now from the Lakers to our next destination, and that is the other L.A. team. Sorry, Clippers fans. That's the way it is for now. For now. Possibly. Could it switch? We don't know. It's not what we're here for. We're here for fantasy stuff. The Clippers. Home of newly minted superstars, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. A duo, a dynamic duo that's going to make the Clippers a very good basketball team and a very complicated fantasy team. Ooh, boy, is this a complicated mess. So the Clippers have two superstars, one of whom is coming off a pair of shoulder surgeries this offseason, and the other one, who played 60 games last year, largely because his team decided, we're fine, we only need you for 70% of the year. I don't know, I don't know that you can draft either of these superstars which is mind-boggling because they likely will both be inside the top 10 in fantasy value on the course of the season. Floated, Paul George will obviously be the threes and the steals that do a lot of the damage for him. Kawhi, it's just all the way across the board. He's one of the rare fantasy players that is generally a positive impact guy in every field, who slightly sub-average in blocks this last year. That was basically it. He and Anthony Davis are often... Or a nose and nose in that one. Uh, Kawhi Leonard was number seven. Paul George was number three. I mean, these guys had incredible fantasy seasons last year. Kawhi without a massive superstar sidekick. So he got 19 shots a game. Paul George with a superstar sidekick. And he still took 21 shots a night. They're going to a team that has more depth. But that's not really my main concern with these guys. In fact, I don't even get past the first thing the first big factor that pops into my head. And that is with Paul George, unless we know he's 100% healthy coming into the start of the season, I'm not drafting him. You know, if we get word that he's going to miss the first week of the year, nope, he's out. Out. Not going to risk it. Because guys that could miss the first week could miss the first three weeks. And then it could be a lingering thing. It's like, oh, we got to get back on the court. Uh, The season started. I got to play. Oh, I'm not healthy. Ouch. And then down again. So we'll know more about Paul George, obviously, by the end of training camp. uh, And hopefully a little bit earlier than that. But right now, guys coming off of injuries, especially first-round picks, because it'll cost you a first-rounder. Coming off of an injury? No. I need my first-round guy playing in that first damn game of the year. He needs to be in there. And if an injury happens later in the season, so be it. Fluky stuff, fine. That stuff happens. But if you're telling me that my guy, my first-round pick, is not playing on day one, I am not taking a hit to my games played right out of the shoot. I'm just not doing it. And with Kawhi Leonard, you know, even if he does play on day one, by by game four or five, he's probably not. One of those in there is going to be a night off. I know he said he's healthy. These are all the right things you're going to say. But the Clippers are fine. They have plenty of depth, just like Toronto did. They don't need to run him out there every night. You might see him actually play the first, like, 10 games of the year while everybody's getting used to one another. And as soon as they do, then it's rest time. So while as good as I think both of those guys will be this year, I don't think I'm drafting either of them. 
at least as of this moment. And I don't see that changing with Kawhi. There is a world where Paul George could work his way back into my good graces, but I need to see him fully healthy before my fantasy draft, or I'm not getting anywhere near that thing. Elsewhere on the Clippers, you have plenty of other names worth mentioning on this team. You have Patrick Beverly, who has been a frequent member of the Dan Bespris Old Man Squad, uh, Jermichael Green, Montrez Harrell, Landry Shamit, Lou Williams, Mo Harkless. These are all guys that have, at times, gotten inside the top 100 in fantasy circles. Let's knock a few of those names out. Patrick Beverly. One of my absolute favorites in fantasy and likely to be underrated in fantasy again. Now, the end result for Bev this year is likely to be a little bit screwy. You know, his team got better. Although they did get rid of Shea Gilgis Alexander, who was one of the sort of point guards of the future thing going on in Clipper Town, and they brought in two wings. So it's not as though guys at his position necessarily got much deeper on this team. In fact, I, I might argue that they got thinner at point guard. Lou Williams, yeah, he's going to play point. He can also slide over and play shooting guard just with the scoring stuff going on. Uh, Mo Harkless, obviously not playing point guard. So that pretty much wipes that out. What that tells me is that for Beverly, who really started to look like himself oh, from about January on last year, he really wasn't himself early in the season, Patrick Beverly is going to have opportunity to be on the floor for this team. And that's what it takes for members of the Dan Bespris Old Man Squad. You just need to be out there because he's not going to be a usage guy. You know, when he's on the floor, it's going to be he gets his three, four, five, three-point attempts per game, and you hope that two of those go in. He's going to rebound from the point guard spot. He'll get his handful of assists because, again, he's playing point guard, and then it steals and blocks. He's an off-kilter fantasy asset, which are some of my favorite. He's a point guard that gets you rebounds, blocked shots that you don't normally find yourself getting at the point. And people, I I hope that this is the case. I think people are going to look at last year and see his full season numbers, which weren't good. He was number 123 on the entire year. And right off the fact that for the last two months of the season, he was a top 50 guy. In fact, he was right around number 50. I don't think he's going to be number 50 for an entire season. I also don't think he's going to be number 150 for a season. The reality is that he's healthier this year. The Clippers obviously love him. They gave him money to stay. He's going to play. He's going to be out there. They want other people that can defend, keep folks in front of them, because the Clippers' defensive back line is not very good. If he's a Zubats, meh. Montrez is a high-energy guy, and he'll be flying around a little bit, but he's not a big body. But, of course, with Beverly, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, guys like that on the floor, ain't nobody getting anywhere near the rim anyway. They're stuck on the perimeter. So I think you're going to see plenty of Pat Beverly. I think you're going to see a steal. I think you're going to see .6, .7 blocks a game. You're going to see anywhere from one to two three-pointers a night. You're going to see the type of stuff we saw minus a little bit post-All-Star break. It'll just be slightly fewer shots, which sort of doesn't matter for members of the Dan Bespris Old Man Squad. So yeah, absolutely, Pat Beverly is a top 100 guy for me, and I would take him in no man's land. Towards the end of drafts, that's where he's going to be available. Mo Harkless, uh, not sure that I can trust him to be on the floor enough to be a top 100 guy, so I'm going to probably punch him off the list. Uh, Landry Shamit, his game is predicated on efficiency and three-point shooting. I don't think there's quite enough of that for a full season for him, so he's kind of off my list. He's a specialist guy. I could see some scenarios where you might need that for your fantasy team, but... Uh, again, we're looking at guys that are likely going to end the year inside the top 100, and I don't think he makes that list. Montrez will. Montrez Harrell is, to me, one of the more logical answers to this question. He played all 82 games last year, averaged 16.5 points, 6.5 rebounds, 2 assists, a steal, 1.3 blocks on 62% shooting, 61.5. I'm rounding it up. 
uh, from the field, 64% free throws and a uh, reasonable volume, so that is going to ding you a little bit. Looking at this season, they're going to need him because Zubats is, oh, man, not that good. I, I don't know why they gave him as much money as they did. Maybe they saw something that I haven't in watching him a lot. Uh, but Montrez is going to play. Not that they necessarily need a traditional center on the floor, because he isn't one, uh, but he's going to have so many open looks, and they're still going to get him out there with Lou Williams, his pick-and-roll running buddy. There will be a hit, most likely on the offensive side, uh, with the way that the Clippers are likely to stagger guys like Paul George and Kawhi Leonard. I don't think you're going to see as many possessions that are a Montrez and Lou Williams pick-and-roll, but it's still going to be happening, and he's going to learn how to play with the Kawhis, with the Paul Georges, who don't run as many pick and roll opportunities but guys are still there's this gravity concept that i think people are talking about a lot in in the nba these days and those two dudes paul george Kawhi leonard they both have a ton of it so montrez is going to find his openings you'll likely see the points come down from near 17 to more towards 14 or 15 the rebounds should be able to stay relatively constant maybe they come down a tiny bit steals blocks they should be fine percentages should be about the same he was number 71 in 9-cat last year. I may, you know, would bring that down by a round. So that's inside the top 100. And this is the one I think that's going to freak people out a little bit. Lou Williams was number 102 last year. Averaging 20 points a game. There are not that many guys that average 20 points a game and don't make the top 100. In fact, last year, Sweet Lou was the only one. Now, admittedly, he was right on the cusp at number 102, so we're splitting hairs a tiny bit. But what it tells you is that the rest of his game last year was severely lacking. Only 1.43 pointers. I think that's going to surprise people to hear a number that low with as much scoring as he did. High volume, terrific foul shooter. That's one of the areas where he does contribute to your game. 5.3 assists per night. A lot of those to Montrez Harrell. But all of this stuff has taken a hit. There is no universe where on this team, Lou Williams runs as many possessions as he did last year. He's not getting 15 shots a night. It's just not happening. And so if the volume's coming down, and the free throw per game is coming down, and the points per game is coming down, and the threes and the assists are all coming down, and the only thing that's getting a boost here is the field goal percent, which was at 42.5 on 15 shots, and now it might be 43 on 13 shots. That's not enough to counterbalance it. And to me, I don't think Lou Williams ends the year in 9-cat as a top 100 guy. There's a world where needing someone who scores late in your draft makes a lot of sense, but he's going earlier than that. And frankly, if you're taking a guy that you think could score 20 points per game with a wank st- sort of a off fantasy game late in a draft I might go Derrick Rose instead his team's going to need him to score more out in Motown but we're not there yet so no uh not a massive fan of Lou Williams fantasy outlook for this year remember when he had that stretch of first round values averaging like 40 points a game that was wild but this is who he is he is a score first guy who found his running buddy in Montrez Harrell, or Montrezl, as we like to call him around here. And he just got pushed down the pecking order by two spots. He was, I might argue, the number one option on that team at the end of the year, along with Danilo Gallinari. After Tobias Harris was traded, and Lou Williams is now... No better than third. Third option. Go from first to third. I, you know, I don't care all the little ways you can split hairs and, and cut it every which direction. That's a downgrade. That's a downgrade. And he was barely, he was right at the top 100 as it was. So downgrade that. And that's not a guy I'm drafting in a standard nine cat roto situation. It's just not. I love Lou. I love sweet Lou. He might be taking some of their biggest shots at the end of ball games, frankly. But he ain't taking 15 to 16 a night, not while this team is healthy. 
And I don't see the whole team getting hurt at the same time like it did a couple years ago when he was the only man on the floor for a month and went bonkers. I like your Michael Green, by the way. I do think he's going to play for this team. I just I don't think it's going to be quite enough to get him over that hump. He didn't even make the top 125 last year, so I, I don't see any reason why that should take a massive leap this coming season. He'll have stretches. A lot of these guys will. Mo Harkless will probably have a couple weeks in there where he's inside the top 100, and Lou obviously will. You know, he'll have a game or two where... That gives him a two-week stretch of top 100 value or better. You know, we're talking about the full season, though. Shamit, same thing. Zubats, maybe. I don't know. Jermichael Green, probably. All these guys are going to have these little spurts, but the average at the end of the year is going to leave us with Montrez, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, Pat Beverly. Those are your four guys inside the top 100. And again, I'm not drafting Kawhi and Paul George, at least unless we get some sort of outstanding health report on PG. By the way, uh, I do love the fact that they're 213 LA area code. That's pretty cool. You know, looking at my rosters, the guy you're going to see on most of them is Pat Beverly. And I do think he takes a step back from that stretch towards the end of last year. But, oh, his game is so helpful to get late in a fantasy draft. Boost your rebounds, both defensive stats and threes and assists without sacrificing much, again, late in a draft, uh, plugging it into a guard spot. It gives you so many options. It gives you so much versatility when you get all of those different categories from one guy. And you can plop him, and he doesn't have to chew up a forward or center spot on your roster. It's a really neat tool to have off positional stats, and it creates versatility on your roster because you could start an extra guard if you wanted to. You could start an extra forward. It just allows you the freedom to do more things on your fantasy team. It's like the Dodgers baseball mentality. You just keep piling up versatility. But it really does help. I mean, especially later in a year. If you have guys that are just giving you across-the-board stats and you're trying to make a run at one particular category, you just yank a guy out of your superfluous stuff and you don't have to worry as much because you have this massive buffer coming from these across-the-board guys that you were able to snag late in your fantasy draft. I don't think, by the way, I'm going to end up with a ton of of, uh, Montrez either because of the free-throw situation. You guys know my feeling on poor free-throw shooters. It's just It takes so much effort to fight with that percentage category all season long. You're just watching your guy praying he doesn't get to the foul line. It's a bad feeling. And I think we have to put a pin in this one now because we're up in over 50 minutes on the podcast, which doesn't give us enough time to do a third team. So we only got two into this sucker. Confound it. I really wanted to do the Warriors too. All right, well, we'll do them tomorrow. We're talking to Neil Rochelani on tomorrow's podcast. We got our next chunk of season win totals to go over, and then we'll knock out one or two teams to break down as well. We might only get through one. This is going to take longer than I expected, guys. But (laughs) spoiler alert here at the end of the show... Uh, my plan from the beginning of the show was a harebrained and idiotic plan. Uh, we're not going to get to two to three teams per show. We're going to get two, some, one on others, and then every once in a while we'll hit a team where it's just like, I don't care. That might be the Pistons. We're going to get to some teams like that, and it'll be like, okay, sweet, then we can get to three today. Anyway, thank you for listening, everybody. This is Monday's Fantasy NBA Today. Again, tomorrow, Neil Rochelani will talk season win totals and additional team breakdowns here on the show uh, Brandon Marcus actually under the weather right now. He sent me a note this morning saying that he has a throat infection. I'm giving that away on the show. So uh, I'm only saying it because I'm usually the one who's beat up. But uh, we may have old uh, Brandon Marcus on the IL this week. So we'll uh, we'll get through stuff as we see fit. Um, Neil and Josh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, on Thursday. Adrian and Coach on Friday. That's always a fun one to take you through the weekend. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Go rate and review the podcast. Rate and review, rate and review, rate and review. Echo chamber here. Uh, rate and review the podcast if you have a moment. We love those five-star reviews. It really does help us, especially here leading into the busy season where people are looking for their new fantasy outlet. The higher we are rated, the easier it is for us to grow during this August, September, October stretch. This is so critical. So please, if you have 100 seconds, 
You can do it in 99 if you're fast. Search out where to do the rate and review on whatever platform you're using uh, and toss us a maximum review. Thank you, thank you, thank you. At Dan Bespris on Twitter, if you have any questions on these two teams we profiled today, would love to keep that going in the social media realm. And with that, I bid you adieu. Have a wonderful Monday. We'll talk to you tomorrow. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.